Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual composting workshop, Fermi Composting 101. This workshop is sponsored by the DC Department of Public Works. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance is a national nonprofit organization founded in DC in 1974. Public Works has contracted with the Institute to provide home composting training and run its home composting system rebate program. I'm Sophia Hossein, a compost trainer with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Today's webinar features my colleague, Brenda Platt, as the lead trainer. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Sophia. Good morning, everyone. We are going to put a link in the chat if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us. Thanks to all of you for your interest in composting at home and joining us this Saturday morning. We are interested in your feedback and learning how we can improve these moving forward, so feel free to share your thoughts. A few housekeeping notes. Everybody is in listen-only mode. We should have plenty of time for questions at the end, but we'll be pausing to see if you have any clarifying questions on what's been presented. Please type your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel box. Please try to enter your entire question all at once to help us keep track of who's asking, who's asking what. We'll also run a few interactive polls during the workshop. To qualify for the rebate, you must attend an online workshop live and stay through the full presentation. You don't need to stay for the question and answer, but of course we recommend that you do. You will get a PDF version of this presentation and a recording of the workshop after class. And before we get started on worm, com worm composting at home, some of you asked where you can drop off your food scraps in DC. The city has a few options. One is the DC Department of Parks and Recreation's Community Compost Cooperative Network. You can join one of the 50 sites around the city by taking a one hour training, which covers how to drop off your compost, how to drop off and compost your food scraps on your own schedule. This option does involve some volunteer time on your part. To find out more about the Compost Cooperative Network, go to DPR's website here, we'll put it in the chat, and check out the map to find a site near you and to get the contact information for the site manager. Another option will be the Department of Public Works Food Scrap Drop-Off Program at City Farmers Markets. Most of these sites are following new coronavirus safety protocols and are open. Go to the website to check out the hours of operation. Most are Saturday mornings, 8 a.m. to noon, but DuPont Circle is open on Sundays. A number are closed for the winter, so be sure to check operating hours. And we put the link in the chat as well. Another option will be to subscribe to a private service. Uh, the DC area is lucky in having a number of entrepreneurs who will pick up your food scraps weekly. Compost Cab, Compost Crew, Veteran Compost, and O Scrap are some of the operators we know about. They charge a monthly fee for this service. There may be others operating as well. Again, this workshop is part of the Public Works Home Composting Program. If you're just joining us, you must attend this workshop live in order to qualify for the rebate and stay for the whole presentation, at least up until the question and answer. Basically, that means that you can't just watch a recording of the webinar and qualify later. We're going to put a link in the chat to the home composting program for you to reference. And now we have a snapshot of you, our participants. When you registered, we asked you to rate your experience with home composting on a scale of one to five. 33% of you indicated that you had little or no experience. 44% know a little bit, but not much. 17% are composting, but still run into challenges. And 6% are experienced, but still have something to learn. 0% are very confident about your composting ability. We also asked you to give us an idea of the size of your yard. So 6% have a big yard, 23% have a medium yard, 35% have a small yard, and 18% have little to no, a uh, little outside space, and another 18% have no outside space. So that's a good mix of people. Welcome, everyone. Um, for those of you with little or no outdoor space, worm or vermi composting is a great option, as your worm composting bins can be indoors. If you have a yard, you have even more options. You can worm compost and or hot compost. We have a couple more hot composting workshops planned this summer. Um, they're gonna be on Wednesday, August 3rd from 9 to 11 a.m. and on Monday, August 15th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. We are going to put the links in the chat in case you're interested in joining us so that you can register. 
Okay, and now let me introduce you to your instructor for the workshop, my colleague, Brenda Platt. Brenda is the director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative. She's been a home composter for more than 30 years, has been licensed twice in Maryland to operate commercial scale sites, and is a lead trainer for ILSR's Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Train the, Train Train the Trainer program. She's researched and authored numerous reports on reuse, recycling, and composting, including Stop Trashing the Climate. She's received national recognition for her work in composting by the U.S. Composting Council and BioCycle Magazine. Take it away, Brenda. All right. Well, thanks, Sophia, for that great introduction. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this beautiful, finally, Saturday morning. Um, this is, happens to be a picture of us doing a workshop in person in Baltimore and um, where we're I'll, I'll sh just remember this picture. This is one of the techniques for harvesting your compost. Um, and uh, we would much prefer to be in person with you uh, than doing virtual workshop, but we're able to, to engage more people this way. So hopefully we'll be back to doing in person. But what we're going to cover virtually this morning is we're going to go through what is compost, the benefits of of composting generally and then the extra benefits you get when you do worm composting because the worms actually produce even a higher value compost than conventional hot composting so we'll go through the differences it's really important to know some basic earthworm facts so we'll share some of those then we'll spend most of the time kind of with worm composting 101, the, what you need to know for the basic principles and go through the steps, the bin, the bedding that the worms live in, how you add the earthworms, how you add your food scraps, how you harvest the compost at the end and keep those worms, how you store your finished compost, and how you might want to use the compost at the end of the process. And then at the very end of this workshop, we'll go through the rebate if you're interested in applying and the the law that gave rise to this program today. And throughout, we're gonna stop and do questions and answers. We have plenty of, of uh, time for breaks. Um, one of the things I wanna do is a shout out to our mentors in particular, Rhonda Sherman, who's an extension specialist with the North Carolina State University. I call her the worm queen. She actually um, hosts an international vermiculture conference uh, every year. There was a little break during COVID, but I think it's happening in person again this year. So, um, Sophia, you can put that chat in, uh, in the chat, put the link in to Rhonda's website. She has an amazing website. Actually, probably most of your questions on vermicomposting can be answered by going to this website. And there's a particular website and web pages for home composters. She also works with schools and farmers. So ch do check out Rhonda Sherman's um, North Carolina State University website. A lot of the information that I'm presenting today, I learned from her. Um, the other thing I'll just say is there's a lot of misinformation on the internet on worm composting and things like worm tea and what it is. Like worm tea is not the liquid that drips from your bin. So that is not worm tea and you probably don't want to use that for any edible plants. And we'll go through that a little bit. But this is a reputable website so take advantage of it. Benny is in our area. He is in uh, a composting guru. I think that's part of his title and it's very apt and he does hot composting and worm composting and he is one of the most amazing people I know and is a part of Eco City Farms which is a, I think I actually have some pictures next which I'll show you in a minute but um, he is one of our trainers and when we do it in person we bring him in to do it to do it with us to do the training so I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to those two people. There's uh, also resources that are available. Rhonda has written this book, The Worm Farmer's Handbook, which is a guide to mid to large scale vermicomposting, worm composting. So if you're associated with a school or a garden or a farm, that may be something you might be interested in. And I just want to point out, we, th we often think of Worm composting is just a small bin you might have in a classroom or in your kitchen or your basement, but there are larger scale sites. This um, uh, top photo on the top right is a correctional facility in South Carolina, and it's outside, and then the one on the 
bottom left shows insulated worm bins in Canada. So kind of indicative that you can do it in cold climates, as is the one shown in Colorado on the bottom right here. That's actually a solar powered school system. And I think the rays are helping with some warmers during the, uh, for the bins in the winter. So you can do worm composting outside. Um, probably need to think about insulating the bins during a deep freeze. So some of you, when you registered, asked, how do we do this year round? And you can do it. But I also think for some of you in apartment buildings, worm composting is a really good option. So this is a screenshot of, of uh, Rhonda's website. The particular link we sent you is vermicomposting for households. You can see she has a video, how to set up a worm bin. We're going to go through that as well today. Um, and then this is a screenshot from Eco City Farms website that I think we also shared in the chat. And here's some pictures of Eco City Farms and the worms. These are actually the worm bins here where they have, and they have many more now, but uh, worm composting is a surface area. And I just want to go back here one more time just to show you that there's, it's a shallow system. The worms feed at the top. And so we don't want worm composting to get hot. They, they, it's a surface area. So the more surface area you have, like these long rows, the more material you can handle. It's not about how deep and how much volume you have. So um, we'll talk more about that. So, um, let's see. So, and you don't have to be a master composter, a master gardener, excuse me, to compost or a master co composter. This is, um, I have a one sunny little patch in the front of my, um, my yard that's, the rest in the backyard is very shady. It's along my driveway. And in this little patch, I grow all these herbs and hot peppers and flowers. So even if you have a small garden and a little patch, you can do quite a bit with them. Um, uh, growing plants and using your compost. All right, so let's talk about, I'm sorry my screen is um, jumping around a little bit. My apologies, I've got two screens and so uh, my mouse is jumpy. All right, what is compost? Well, compost is not soil, but it's a soil amendment and it's full of beneficial microbes and rich in what we call organic matter. And when you make it from worms, it even has more beneficial microbes. Those worms, it's almost like they're pooping out beneficial microbes in the, com in the compost. So I like to call this black gold. I'm not the first one to come up with that name. But composting, whether it's done with worms or hot composting, is a biological process. Um, and there are many benefits to doing composting. When you do vermicomposting, you're relying on earthworms and more microorganisms to help with the process. So that's, um, this is kind of a schematic of, of one type of bin that you can buy. And you can kind of see from the schematic what I was talking about, it being a surface area where the worms are rising up to feed. They're not living really throughout the, the bin. And that's a picture of some of the black gold that I have produced through one of my worm bins. So there's many reasons to compost. These are just some of them. It's a great way to celebrate Earth Day every day. And I think we're going to find that we're really too good at removing our organic matter from our households in our yards that it's not coming back to the soil. So it's a great way to enhance the soil, build soil fertility. I'll show you a poster that we created um, where we highlighted some of that. When you registered, we asked you uh, some of the reasons why you might want to be interested in composting. And some of you said to reduce your trash. And that is a great reason. On average, in the United States, about half of what we put out at the curb for disposal um, is readily compostable and 21% is food scraps alone. So there's a lot of uh, material that we could be composting at home. Now, not all of the kitchen scraps, you can, not all of them are good for worm composting. 
one of the benefits of hot composting is it can handle a wider variety of materials. And we'll go through that in some detail in a few minutes. But a lot can be composted at home. This is a snapshot of one family, happens to be mine. Your household may differ. And we're a family of four. We generate close to 14 pounds of food scraps a week. And of that, I am home composting about 10 pounds a week. So I'm not putting in any meat or dairy or cooked food into my hot composting bin. I do hot composting and worm composting. And I am worm composting 18%. I would probably be doing more worm composting. It could handle a higher portion if I wasn't also doing hot composting. So sorry this is a little conf confusion, confusion, confusing, but uh, I just wanted to really emphasize that a lot of what we're generating can be handled at home, even if you're not doing the meat and the bones and that kind of food scraps in your bin. Uh, I mentioned the poster we produced about the soil benefits. This is part of the poster, and it really is all about the soil because you're producing a comp compost is a soil amendment, and at the end of the day or the end of the month, when you're done producing it, it's gonna go, you're gonna use it for something. It's gonna go back into the soil in some way. So think about how you're gonna use that finished compost even if you're in an apartment. Um, some of the benefits includes enhancing soil tilth, fertility, uh, compost helps suppress plant disease, it improves something that we call cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of soil to retain nutrients. One of the biggest benefits of adding compost to soil is it helps soils uh, enhance their water holding capacity. So in when we're having drought conditions, which we're not having right now, but when we have drought conditions, it could be the difference between your tomato plant surviving or not su surviving. And even when we're having all these rain events, it can help prevent the soil washing out, soil erosion, um, help cut stormwater runoff. So adding compost, this black gold, this organic matter to your soil has many benefits, including enhancing soil structure. And then when we are using worm compost, there's even more benefits. Um, the, um, the compost itself has like a high surface area. It even has higher water holding capacity, higher nutrient holding capacity. Uh, some of the studies have shown that when you're using it on your plants, you have accelerated germination. You have um, faster seedling growth and bigger seedling growth. You have early flowering. The, the pH is near neutral in compost, but there's more plant available nutrients in vermicompost, there's more plant growth hormones. So lots of benefits with producing uh, worm composting, uh, worm compost, and doing worm composting. The climate benefits cannot be understated. So if you're concerned about the climate, composting is a win-win activity that virtually everyone can do. If we're lucky, we get three meals a day, and so we're coming into those food scraps maybe three times a day and so we can do something about that when food scraps end up in a landfill they contribute to methane emissions which is a highly potent greenhouse gas um, and most of our food scraps almost all of our garbage in dc ends up burned at the uh goes to the trash incinerator in lorton and Incinerators also produce climate and other pollutants, so we really want to do what we can to stop the flow of our food scraps and our yard trimmings going to landfills and incinerators. The benefit, too, when we produce that black gold and we put it into soil is that it acts as a carbon sink, drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and, and kind of sequestering it in the soil. And then when we're enhancing plant plant growth, we're enhancing photosynthesis, so we're getting more oxygen and less carbon dioxide because, as we know, plants absorb carbon dioxide. So composting is really, like I said, a win-win for the environment in uh, many ways. Our colleague um, produced this um, uh, graphic compost for a better planet to kind of capture some of those benefits. We're reducing trash, we're enhancing soil, we're growing our community, and we're protecting the climate. And I think Sophia put the link in uh, for some of our uh, other infographics. There's one, a more recent one we did on um, 
that's kind of long on the benefits of composting to combat the climate crisis, but it's kind of long to show in a PowerPoint. But check it out and please feel free to share any of these. Um, there, we made them so that they would be shared. Now, if any of you have kids, one of the benefits of worm composting is kids love worms. So I've done some workshops with kids. This is a workshop I did with the um, Boys and Girls Club in Baltimore before COVID. And when I first had the kids, they like wouldn't touch the worms, go in the bin, they're ooh, ooh, gross. But by the end of the hour, we couldn't get them to stop touching the worms. So it's a great way to engage kids if you've, if, if you've got children um, or other youth that you engage with in, in the process. All right, so now let me just summarize the differences uh, kind of briefly between worm composting, known as vermicomposting, and hot composting. So hot composting gets hot. You want, you're aiming to get above 80 degrees. You're, the sweet spot is really like 120 degrees to 150 degrees. That's mesophilic, thermophilic temperatures are up there. It, and, and if you've taken our hot composting workshop, you'll know the benefits of doing that. Um, worms, they like this basically the same temperature as we do. So they're going to live in the 55 to 85 degree range is where they're more comfortable. So if it's too hot for us, it's too hot for them. If it's too cold for us, it's too cold for them. So keep that in mind. We don't want our bin to get hot. So it's not um, volume, as I said before, is not important. It's surface area. Um, they like more moisture. Hot composting needs a lot of water. So that's one of the key ingredients for success, no matter what type of composting you do. If your system outside for hot composting is too dry, nothing's going to happen. Those microbes go dormant. The worms breathe through their skin, so they need the moisture um, in a high moisture environment in which to live because they breathe through their skin and they can you cannot let them dry out they will die um, they the worm bin they do worms do not like vibration you do not want to handle the worms roughly so no turning um, they need some oxygen but it's not a lot like hot composting so it's more passive aeration and there's no turning involved whereas with hot composting you're turning your pile, you're tumbling it, you're getting your pitchfork in, you're trying to get the air in there. Uh, the other uh, benefit of worm composting is you have finished composting, finished compost you can use within a month. And in hot composting, it's really, you know, three to six months till you have that nice finished mature compost to use. So worm composting can be faster. The other difference, I should update this slide because I kind of mentioned already is, Hot composting can handle more materials, and worms, it's a kind of a smaller range of materials. I'll get into it more, but just to give you an idea now, they don't like citrus. You don't want to put citrus in your bins. Um, they don't like garlic, onion, anything in that family. Um, more surface area is better. So, you know, maybe chopping your materials is more important. Hot composting is more forgiving. There's less in some ways, less work involved. All right, so when we're talking about home composting, hot home composting, you have many options. And when we're talking about vermicomposting, you also have many options. I'll show towards the end of this workshop some examples of some worm composting bins that you can buy. And there's lots of options on the market that you can use your rebate for. All right, so now let's get into some earthworm facts. So they're a cold-blooded animal. They're not an insect. They have no lungs, so that's why the moisture is important. They breathe through their skin, and they will die, again, if their skin dries out. Um, they're hermaphroditics, which means that um, they're male and female. They're both genders. They have sperm and an egg, but they don't self-produce. So it does take two to tango. Um, and it's important to understand these little work workhorses. Um, they can't they can't shiver, right? So um, again, whatever the ambient temperature is, that's what they are. So 
if it's cold outside, they're going to be cold. So if you do are thinking of doing worm composting outside, when we when we know there's a deep freeze coming, it's going to be below 30 degrees. You may think about insulating your bin. I have gotten like old blankets from a thrift store and thrown it over my bin and put a tarp over it which really helps and the worms will go into the middle of your bin so they'll just move where it's warmer so they do do kind of self-preservation as well but you do have to facilitate a comfortable temperature for them and the air exchange they need oxygen but it goes through their skin as well and the only way for that to take place again is if their skin is moist they don't have eyes but they have light receptors so we need to protect them from the light so Worm bins, they never come in the clear plastic. If you're going to make your own, don't buy that clear plastic, uh, Rubbermaid, you know, any clear tubs. You want opaque ones. You want lids that the light doesn't come through. If you've, um, after it's rained, if you've seen worms on a sidewalk or on the street and you're wondering, why don't they just wiggle back to the grass? That's because after they've been um, uh, in the light, in the sunlight for like 60 minutes, they become paralyzed. They literally cannot move. So this is a picture of, uh, you can see the asphalt under my hand. I've collected worms on the asphalt and I toss them back into the, into the, into the green space, whether it's a lawn or anything, because they'll just die. They can't move, they're paralyzed by the light. Um, babies hatch from cocoons, which are smaller than like a, a grain of rice. And I do have some pictures of that. Um, uh, that I will show you when I get to it. So there are, interestingly enough, something like more than 9,000 species of earthworms. And a few years ago, I think only 7,000 had been identified. So it seems like scientists are always identifying more species. But you have to use the correct species for worm composting. So you cannot just go into the nearby woods or your backyard and dig up earthworms. We have to use the right species. The other thing I find really interesting about worms is that some of them, this is not a snake. This is a 13 foot worm. This one is in Australia. But even in America, I think it's in the Pacific Northwest, there, sh there used to be much longer worms, um, but they don't like development. They don't like vibration and you don't see them as often. But I find that fascinating that they, come in so many uh, different sizes. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the different basic uh, different species of worms. There are different categories of worms. By the way, I should have said this before, that there's marine worms and there's worms that invade our bodies. But these are earthworms, these 9,000 species. We're talking about um, earthworms. So most people think earthworms are all alike and they're really not. not. Um, and it's important to get the right kind. Now, scientists have divided earthworms into these three different categories, depending on what they like to eat and where they live. So the epigeic, which is shown in this graphic in the top left, they do not live in soil. They kind of live under animal dung, kind of cow patches in pastures. They live under leaf litter, which is shown here, leaf litter being like a pile of leaves, and they live um, in compost piles. But epigeic worms, they do not burrow, and they do not live in soil. Now, en endogeic worms, they live in soil. They're rich soil feeders, and they have these kind of horizontal burrows. And then anisic worms, they both live in soil, but they also feed on the litter at the top and they have extensive vertical burrows they tend to be a little little bigger which we tried to show with this schematic as well but there are only seven species out of that 9,000 species of earthworms that have been identified that are good for vermicomposting and here we show them and there's uh, three species that do live in tropical areas so if you have traveled to to Africa or the Caribbean, or you end up moving there, just know that there are species that will uh, you can use for vermicomposting in different parts of the globe. In our area, there's four that thrive in the temperate region, and the one that's the most popular that we recommend is Isenia fetida, 
known more commonly as red wigglers. So, um, you know, they're the number one pretty much used around the world too. And the reason that they're, we recommend them and they're number one is they respond to a wider variety of environmental conditions. Um, so they kind of will move in captivity and um, breed. So they're the, they're the most, most popular. All right, so now I'm going to give you some facts about that particular earthworm, which is, again, the one we recommend that you get. So it's no fun to count out earthworms. Nobody's counting, a, 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 you know, a thousand earthworms. So the kind of guideline is one pound of earthworms is about a thousand worms. So when you go to order um, the earthworms, and Sophia can put the this... Um, uh, uh, link into the into the website. There's other places to go to buy your earthworms. This is just one reputable site that we know of, and we're not really endorsing any particular site, but I will just say that there's a lot of um, misinformation, or they might say these are red wigglers. You want to order them by the Latin name, the Isenia fetida, and not order from any site that's just selling red wigglers, okay? So just keep that in mind, particularly working with a site that's um, servicing and marketing around composting, okay? And I should have clarified that vermiculture is the, is the process of, of breeding or growing worms, and vermicomposting is when you're using worms to produce the compost. So if you've heard of vermiculture, that's kind of a little bit different than vermicompost. Okay, so uh, to get started for what you need for one square foot of surface area of a bin, you want to start with one to two pounds of worms. If you have less than that or you start on the lower end, that's fine. They're going to, they're going to, breed and and populate and so you'll have if you start with one pound you'll end up with more than one pound and you'll be able to handle more food scraps worms can eat 25 to 35 percent of their body weight each day in food scraps or other stuff that they're eating like the cow manure or the leaf litter that i mentioned so if you have three pounds of worms and three square feet of bin, you can give them about a pound of food scraps a day. They will eat it. But if you have fewer worms, you can't, you don't want to overfeed them. Again, don't get the worms from a yard or bait shop. Not only will might not be the right type of worm, but it could be more expensive. So buy from a worm grower. Prices vary. And um, I didn't actually look into the more recent prices to see um, where they are right now, I think they're they're kind of trending closer to the 50, 40 to 50 dollars a pound. All right, so let's just talk about the life cycle of um, of a of a worm. So, and this picture on the left shows the mating, by the way, uh, the schematic. So I just want to, so if I I'd be careful here, I don't advance the slide inadvertently, but this little band that you see is called the clitellum, and this is where you need two to mate, so they kind of come side by side here, and they join here, and then there's a formation of the cocoon on that band, and then it kind of comes off, and it's about one-eighth of an inch the size of a, of a of a grain of rice, as I said. So if you if if you have a worm bin, you might be uh, get to see them see them mating. But what you have is, um, you know, after the cocoon, and there's like mm, two to four uh, babies that come out of a co cocoon, and then after you know three close to four weeks, um, it's uh, it's going this way. Sorry, the, the cocoon. Then you have them. Um, uh, come out of the cocoon, and then they'll mature um, after another three to four weeks. And then, um, then they once they're mature, about five days they're mating, and you can see this kind of this cycle. And so they're continually reproducing in your bin if you're, you know, have the right moisture feeding them, and you have a healthy bin con conditions. They do have gizzards. Um, and so they like a little grit in the bin, so crushing your eggshells can help provide that. Um, little coffee grounds, we recommend 
also when you're starting out like a handful of, of, of soil can help provide the grit but remember they don't live in soil so you're not putting you're not creating a bedding of soil if you're adding a handful of grit to your bin or a handful of soil to add grit for their gizzards it's it's really just to help them with their digestive tract so keep that in mind this is um, a picture of the cocoons and here we we actually I was able to take a picture of them mating which I thought was really cool and then the young worms here they're they tend to be like white colored and, and really small so those are just some pictures to see what's going on in the bin so what we're going to do is pause to see if you have any questions on kind of the life cycle what worms of uh, worms what worms to get and what we're going to get into next is uh, really a deeper dive into the steps of how to compost Thanks, Brenda. So no questions have come in yet. This is a good reminder. If you do have any questions, put them in the GoToWebinar control panel questions box and we can see them on our end. But since none have come in yet, I think it's okay to proceed. Good. All right. So now let's talk about the composting process. So these are your basic five principles to keep in mind. So because the worms are rising up to the top of the bin, it's a surface area. Again, they don't burrow and live in burrows and live in the soil they epigeic worms the type that we're getting this asenia fetida they live at the surface underneath the leaves so we are using and harnessing that same knowledge in our worm bin so you're gonna um, add organic ma materials your food scraps in thin layers at the top so the worms rise up and eat that at the top they do require aerobic conditions meaning they need some oxygen and so you're going to not put them in a bin that's completely enclosed it's going to have little holes in it again i talked about um, the temperature and the moisture and you're never going to cover the beds with impermeable materials like plastic because that's going to prevent the oxygen from coming in uh, coming into the bin all right so these are the steps to getting started we're going to go through now you can buy a bin and if you buy a bin you're this you can get up to the 75 dollars rebate that the dc department of public works is offering we we run the nonprofit that sophia and i are with the institute for local self-reliance we run that program uh, for the city so you can buy a bin or you can make your own uh, i have in my uh, basement uh, few that I bought and a few that I made so pretty easy to make a bin you're going to add bedding we're going to tell you how to do that to the bin and make that nice bedding that's moist that they can live in then you're going to add your earthworms we're going to go through how you feed them with the food scraps and the uh, the fruit and vegetable scraps and then after a month you can probably begin to harvest some of the verm comp composting you don't have to do it at, at a month you can usually you know wait a little longer if you want and then you're either using your compost or you're storing it um, so you have to think think about that so here's um, some of the bins that you can you can buy just to give you a sense of uh, and they they're different prices too some have more trays but the idea with the trays is that and all the trays have holes and what the holes do is it allows the worms to crawl up to to get to the next tray of food. So what you're doing is you're starting with one tray, you're putting the bedding on the tray, you're putting the food scraps, you're putting the worms in, and when they eat all that food scraps and the bedding, the bedding goes too, they consume it all. You're giving them bed that they can bedding that they can eat. Then you're gonna let that, and you'll see it's turned into that black gold. You'll see it's not newspaper anymore and it's not uh, a, a banana peel. And then you'll say, okay, it's time, I want to harvest that. So now let me start a new tray above it. And then you put new bedding and um, the food scraps and the worms just travel through the holes in the, in the bottom tray to rise up to feed. And when the worms have all moved up, that's when you can harvest the tray below. So these are the kind of branded ones you can buy. If you're making your own, you know, you can get a couple of Rubbermaid containers that kind of stack. You can see this one has a ridge, so it's not going to fall in. It kind of sits, uh, nestles in, and drill a few holes, 
and the and uh, it kind of you can achieve the kind of same thing that a store bought one can do. Um, and this is us in a workshop showing how to to make that where we're drilling holes. Oops. Um, and uh, drilling holes at the bottom, this one, and then uh, around the side to let the air in. The photo on the right is showing the newspaper bedding in this particular example. If you're buying Rubbermaid bins at a, your local hardware store, the rebate does not cover the cost of doing that. So you really do have to buy a worm bin that's already put together. Um, you can in addition to like the plastic ones, you can build your own and be creative, or if you're associated with a garden, these are kind of fun. These are uh, the two top ones I've seen at gardens, and the bottom one was at a farm that had a lot of youth groups coming in, a lot of tours all the time, that's uh, made from a repurposed bathtub, which I just loved. But, you know, if you're sitting on this bench, and these are two different benches, by the way. That's not the same bench. There are two different sites. You can see the one on the left has a big tree behind it. Uh, but if you open it up, the worm bends inside, kind of insulated in, in the picture on the right. And so it's kind of cool with kids, school, to do that. And I, I know people who have turned co their coffee tables into worm bins inside their homes. So, yeah, you can, you can really be creative. So these are um, some examples of worm bins. Um, and you can see these are kind of like in a garage somewhere, so you can make them look nice. These are in somebody's workspace. But the one on the left is really small. It's a three-gallon bin. It's only seven inches deep, so the surface area is less than one square foot. So you can't really, you know, that size I had because it's easy for me to take to workshops and festivals and and, and, you know, when they're fully loaded with the moisture and the bedding and the worms and the compost being produced, they're kind of heavy. So it's not as easy to move around. But I had that small one as a demonstration. I don't really recommend it for handling your food scraps because you, you can only do like at most one third a pound of food scraps a day in there. This is um, the middle one is one of the brands, a can of worms. And the surface area, there's two square feet. Um, and then the one on the right is another do-it-yourself system where it's almost two square feet, so surface area. So keep in mind that the, the, the bigger the surface area, the more food scraps you can handle. So we're going to run a poll now to, to ask you if you do, I'll run it, Sophia, if you are, um, where would you most likely place a worm composting bin? So this is something that you you know, have to consider. Maybe you don't have a garage. Maybe you don't have a basement. Hmm, maybe under my kitchen sink doesn't have a lot of space. All right, we've got half of you voting. I'd like to get it a little bit higher. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So, yeah, so three quarters of you are thinking outside, zero garage. Basements are great, 18%. A kitchen, you know, can certainly work. It's convenient, but, you know, if you're doing one of those bigger um, bins, uh, it might not fit under the kitchen sink. So you're probably looking at something a little smaller. And 0% are not sure, but something something really obviously you have to, to think about. Okay, so... Let's move on, let's see. Okay, so now step two, um, adding bedding. So let me just say, it used to be easier to add the bedding because we, so many of us subscribe to a newspaper, right? So you could just, if you have access to newspapers or you just get the Sunday paper, it's good to, to save that. Um, there are still free circulars around in our communities, so you can uh, pick those up. Uh, I'm surprised by how many paper bags flow through my household. So whether it's takeout food or packaging now, because so much of, of orders when you order stuff is avoids um, styrofoam. So you're seeing paper coming in uh, boxes that you order. And paper's really easy, to, sh easy to, sh to shred if it's kind of got the ridges at the top with newspaper. You just kind of rip it in one direction. If you try to rip it the other way, it doesn't work as easily, but you can just rip it into um, uh, pieces. You you want to soak uh, 
the paper in a in a bucket of water or a sink. This is a, one of our in-person workshops. This is Kareem demonstrating with a five-gallon bucket. It's he's got. Uh, the strips of paper in there. We let it soak for 10 minutes so the paper soaks it and then we drain it a little bit so it's not dripping but if you squeeze the water out of the paper then the paper can clump so you want it when you're putting it in the bin shown in the screen bin here you want the paper to be kind of fluffed up and not in clumps so but not dripping but just moist. Now you can use fall leaves um, and and kind of soak them too and, and put them in, kind of drain them. So again, they're not dripping, but they're moist and they've absorbed the water. If you're ordering a worm bin online, often it will come with the brick of this coir or coconut fiber. So, um, you know, usually just you can add it to your, um, to your, your, uh, shop you know what you're buying and it's like three dollars to add it so that can be an option and it looks really small but once you uh, you know open that it's kind of you know it's a it's a lot and we recommend Benny taught me this is that to soak that too sometimes it can be high in salt so by just soaking it and rinsing it in water the coconut fiber you're kind of rinsing out um, some of the salts and you can shred cardboard too but this is the kind of bedding and I tend to use a little bit of a mix of leaves and and paper I have not ever myself used coconut coir I like to use local sources that's my preference but you do want to soak it and drain it before adding it to the bin and you fill your bin two-thirds of the way up so not to the top but all of this is gonna all of this is gonna uh, disappear very quickly in a, in a few. So you pre-moisten it, um, squeeze the water out, fluff it, fill the bin halfway or two-thirds, and add more bedding as it disappears. The worms do not like to live in their own uh, worm poop, so at, at some point you'll just get it and you'll know that the, the bedding's all gone um, and uh, I need to change it or put a new tray or st you know st start getting them to move up with new bedding. It's helpful to have one of these sprayers um, this uh, water sprayer so that if they look like their skin's not glistening you can just spray spray in the bin um, as you're adding your food scraps so I just keep a water sprayer near my bin I mentioned uh, adding a handful of soil for the grit but it's also a way to kind of inoculate your bin one handful I don't know how they estimated this, but has about 3 trillion microbes. So that's a lot of beneficial microbes that you can get in your bin. And it's not just the worms that are doing the work in your bin. They're working in concert with a wide range of um, microorganisms that are thriving in the bin. All right, so step three, you're going to, you've got your bedding. You can see that this the bedding on the right in the bin is all this moist shredded newspaper. When you order your worms through one of these reputable vermiculture worm sites, worm growers, it'll, um, the best ones, the one, ones we, uh, the, the link we shared, like they'll say, we don't ship on a Thursday or Friday because they don't want the worms hanging out over the weekend somewhere. So they tend to ship on a Monday so it can get there before Saturday. So they pay attention to this. They um, will put them in some bedding that helps them actually not thrive as much, not be as active uh, when it comes, but you do not need to do anything but dump that, uh, what it comes in, into the top of your bin. You don't need to stir. You leave the lid off for a few minutes in bright sunlight or under a light. And remember, they don't like light, so they will go into your bin and not stay on the surface. But don't try to handle the worms. They have sensitive skins. They um, will move to uh, feed. And we've already um, put this one in the website. This is a screenshot that I took a while ago, so I didn't do this just yesterday. But you can see, at least when I took this, one pound was $20, two pounds was $56. Um, and they say, worms are only shipped on Mondays and Tuesdays to avoid sitting in the post office. All right, so, and then another local source we share, I don't know if um, Jeffrey Neal is the um, um, uh, CEO of Loop Closing and the founder, and they're a local company. Um, we'll put the, the link in the chat here that um, 
does consulting on all types of composting, but he also does worm composting, and when he has worms, he will sell them. So you can reach out through the website. There's a contact list and ask if they're selling any worms, and so you might be able to support a local business and not have to get them mailed to begin with. So that's another option for you. Um, okay, so... Step four, now your bin is set up and you're gonna add your food scraps to the bin. So um, you're gonna um, pull back your bedding, you're gonna put your food scraps in and then you're gonna cover the bedding with at least, uh, cover your food scraps, cover the bedding with at least two inches of, of your bedding. So you're gonna wanna have some bedding when you pull it aside, you're going to cover the food scraps. Why do you cover the food scraps? Because you don't want fruit flies in your bin. I think at least one of you mentioned that as one of your questions when you registered. How do I avoid fruit flies? The best way is never leave your food scraps exposed. Now, you are not burying the food in the castings. You're leaving them on top and then covering with the bedding. Because if you bury the food in the compost, in the ca castings, Remember, the, these type of epigeic worms don't burrow. They rise to feed and live on the surface. So we are taking that knowledge and using it in our worm bin. And then what you're going to do is you're going to wait until all the food is gone before adding more in that spot. So often what I do is I add on one side one day, cover it, wait till it's gone, and then I add on another side the next day. If you've got a bigger bin, one of the round ones, which I have, it's even easier. You know, you can add on this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot. But the reason you don't want to add until the food's gone and the spot you've already put food scraps is they will rise, the worms will rise to eat the stuff on top. And then what you've got is rotting food underneath it. So it's really important to wait until the food is gone before you add more on, on top. All right, now let's talk about what can you feed our red wigglers. So on the left, we show the yes, fruit and vegetable scraps that they love. Try to pull those stickers off. Um, otherwise, they won't eat them. It's fine. You'll pull them out of the compost. Eggshells, again, good for the grit is fine. I do think crushing them will help. Um, and even pulverizing is even better in a worm bin. So you can put them in a, a plastic bag or and then roll a rolling pin or a jar or something over it. And it'll, once they're dry, they're nice and powdery. You know, otherwise, the pieces of the eggshell will kind of remain in your bin. It's not a big deal in the compost, but just so you know, coffee grounds, paper filters are actually okay. Tea bags are okay. Just, you know, remove the, the staples if there are any. And this is kind of a longer no list than we have for the hot composting. So no meat, no grease, no bones. No dairy products aside from the eggshells. No animal poop, no cat or dog feces. Um, keep out the hot peppers. They don't like anything in the onion garlic um, family. Citrus fruits and rinds leave out. Very salty foods leave out. Sugary foods, you don't want ants in your bin, so don't put anything that ants are particularly sugary foods attracted to. Some fruit pits will disappear eventually like mangoes but you know if you have cherry pits or peach pits which peaches are in season now you know they just take up space in your bin and they're and they're not really gonna um, biodegrade like they would in a hot composting bin do not put fresh grass clippings in there and again i think i grease is on there twice no fats oils or grease so that's what to leave out all right now worms do not have teeth so you want to um, make it, it'll break down faster if you just chop food scraps while you have them on your cutting board. So on the left is a picture of like more what I would put in my home composting bin. I'm not paying any attention really to, to chopping that much besides a corn cob or a pineapple top. You can see I've got onions, red onions in there. And then on the right, you know, you don't have to mix it, but you know, there's the carrot peelings. And then I've chopped the mango peels just a little bit. I've chopped the banana peels a little bit and cilantro stems a little bit and the apple cores. And then I, I in this picture, I kind of mixed it and the little brown specks are the coffee grounds. But that's a perfect mix to give to your, um, into your worm bin. And, you know, the mango picks, 
pits take a while to break down, but I just wanted to show you that they do break down and the worms, I, I will always, I think they hold the moisture. So I will always find when I open a, a mango pit that there's worms propagating and living in there. So I always put the mango pits in my bin. They eventually, eventually go. All right, so here's just some kind of summary of um, some of the basics. So you wanna provide, you know, up to six inches of bedding. You're gonna add one to two pounds per square foot, at least one pound to start with. Again, if you have less, just know that it's gonna take a while, a month or so to propagate them, to eat more. You wanna apply and feed in a, in a two inch layer at most, probably less than two inches of, of your food scraps, your kitchen scraps. It's better to chop those food scraps into tiny pieces. You wanna wait until it's all eaten before adding more. Always, always cover with your shredded paper or cardboard or cloth. I find that um, sometimes the bin is so moist that when I'm covering the food scraps, it's fine to do dry paper to absorb some of the extra moisture. So in this picture, I'm kind of showing I've covered the food scraps um, uh, with uh, with dry paper. And the, the picture in the middle, you say, wait, I see some avocado skins in there. I was just demonstrating how fast the more chopped food scraps on the right will disappear compared to the mango pits and the avocado, you know, half the avocado skin, which the stuff on the right went a lot, lot quicker. All right, so again, vermicomposting is all about surface area. You wanna add in thin layers. They live, the earthworms live in the top three to six inches and they move as new kitchen scraps are added. So again, pay attention to the temperature, keep the bedding moist. You can do that with the misting. Um, never cover them with a sheet of plastic. These lids that you buy have, have um, uh, holes in them. Um, here's a summary of you know, how you might know when uh, your bin is you know, healthy and when it's kind of something's gone a little off. So you, know, you should not have a rotten odor in your bin. If you, if you do have a rotten odor and it smells bad, something's, something's a little off. Um, there should be few earthworms on the side. So in this picture, I don't know if you can see, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six earthworms. But if you've got a bunch of earthworms on the side, that means something's wrong with the bedding. Maybe the bedding's all gone and there's no food and they're trying to find food or it's too acidic, something's off. If the worms are leaving their bedding, if it's too dry, then that's a sign. They're, they're actually very good communicators. If they don't like the food, like if you do an experiment with your kids, this is a great project. You can put like watermelon rinds on one side of the bin and put maybe some, you know, onion skins on one side and you can show your kids, they're all about the watermelon rinds and the bananas and there's nothing on the onions. They communicate what they like to eat. So it's it's kind of fun and interesting to do that. Um, you want your bedding fluffy, so it has air spaces, again, no clumps. Um, you want it damp, but not soggy and dripping. The earthworms have moist, glistening skins. And um, there's there'll be quantities of small insects that, you know, there's micro and macro microbes and insects that live in the bin. Micro means you really can't see them with the naked eye. Macro, you can, but um, that's that's fine. That's not bad. What you don't want to see is um, a large number of red mites. That's an indication that your bin is too acidic, so you might need to troubleshoot that. And then you want the worm castings, the worm poop, to be accumulating on the bottom. And so unhealthy is a lot of liquid dripping from the bin. Fruit flies, not good bedding's too dry, clumps of food that's not disappearing. So um, pay, pay attention to some of those things. Okay, let's see, what do we got? All right, so we're gonna pause for questions. And um, I think what I'm gonna get into next, just so you know, is some methods for um, how to harvest your worms and your compost. And then, and then how to use it, and then we'll wrap up with the information on the rebate. Okay, so there's there was one question that came in that was particularly on worm bedding, which I think that you covered, and that's what I put in the chat. Okay, we have a couple more coming in now here. Uh, do you have a cheat sheet of what to do when something is wrong? Um, 
I we do not. Uh, I can see. Let me make a note cheat sheet. We'll see if if um, Rhonda has one on hers. So you know, it probably depends on what's going on. If we um, let me just see. Let me just go back a second here to this sh this slide. So you know, if um, if if um, if the earthworms you know don't have moist glistening skin, get your spritzer bottle out and spray in there. Uh, maybe you need to redo the bedding, uh, make new bedding, and make sure it's, it's damp. Um, if um, the worms are trying to escape, try to figure out what's going on. Is, is, it, is there no more bedding? Did you stop feeding them? Are they too dry? So I think, you know, there's some things we kind of just went through that could help you. And I'll see if there's a cheat sheet, troubleshooting, sheet that's readily available that we can share with you in the follow-up email that we send. How do you ensure no maggots? The best way is to cover your food scraps because flies are attracted, you know, to the food, exposed food scraps. And that's where the maggots come from, flies laying their eggs. So two inches of bedding or material covered over your food scraps, no food scraps showing, and then all the bins have a lid. Remember, the worms don't like light, so having a bin over it, and then most of the, the bins, the flies can't get through the small holes that you see, so you want to keep your food scraps covered within the bin, and then you want to make sure that your the, the lid on the bin is secure. That's your best way. Um, why do you have to use fall leaves? And I think the implication here is dry leaves versus green ones. Yeah. So in our hot composting workshop, we spend a lot of time on the recipe to make the microbes thrive, and that's balancing carbon and nitrogen. And we go through that almost all living things need 30 times more carbon than nitrogen. So Plants that are green are more nitrogen rich, like your grass clippings or green leaves, but your fall leaves, which have dried up, are more rich or car considered carbon rich materials. So fall leaves, dry leaves are providing the worms with the carbon they need. So is the bedding, the, the paper, which is why the, the leaves and the bed and the newspaper and the coconut core, they all, all do disappear. So, um, but that's providing them a balance of the carbon and, and the nitrogen is coming from your food scraps. So you're, you're feeding them a balance, but you don't have to pay as much attention uh, to that in your, in your bin. But fall leaves, that's kind of what they live in in a forest. If you ever, you know, yeah. are seeing a pile of leaves under a tree, you know, this fall, you know, move it with your foot or your, your, your shoe or your hand and you'll see worms you know, often worms living under that pile, that's the, it's fall leaves. It's not like fresh leaves that are falling. So we're emulating what these epigeic uh, worms, the conditions under which they live in nature, which is leaf litter, which is leaves that fall from trees. Okay, what do you do when there are mites? Well, that's a sign that your bin is too acidic. So you may have to just, um, um, you could use one of these harvesting techniques to get the worms out, and then you might need to kind of, you know, basically toss the rest of your system. If you have a hot composting bin or know somebody, it's fine to, to put it in there. Um, you, it could be a sign of mites is 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 the pH is off. It's too acidic. So have you been putting citrus in your bin? Uh, one of the reasons we avoid uh, tomatoes, I didn't go through it, was on the no list um, because they can be tend to be acidic. So um, you know, pay attention to what you're you're putting in there. But you may need to you know you can adjust. It's like really too many mites. You know, balance. It's when one organism begins to take over. You want the worms to be the main. You know, this is why we don't have more than one species of worms. We're not putting the Isenia fetida in your bin with another type of, you know, earthworm because then they're competing. You want to make the conditions right for the Isenia fetida. But you may have to start over with new bedding and try to harvest the worms out. Okay. Can newspaper have colored ink? You know, newspaper now has more and more colored ink than it used to, so the answer is yes. 
I do like to just try to find newspaper that avoids the color ink, but know that most of the newspaper and the uh, that has colored ink, the colored ink is soy based. So you don't need to worry about it too much. Do not use magazines or glossy or coated paper. So you know the the if you've ever used um, you know the, your yard waste bags that were that you know, the craft um, yard trimmings bags, those craft paper, those are fine. So sometimes I use those um, more than once to collect leaves and they break down over time or they rip and then eventually I'll rip those and add those. So craft paper is good because it doesn't have brown paper, it doesn't have the inks, so you don't have to worry about it as much. But a little bit of colored newspaper I don't think is a problem. Okay, Brenda, two more questions and then we can jump in. Okay. Um, what I... I need to compost inside my small apartment. Can you discuss best practices for limited space? Yeah, so um, some of these bins, I'll, I think I'll, I think I have more pictures at the end. They're, they're kind of cool looking. Um, so, you know, if you're not gonna have it like under a sink and you're gonna have it out, I would say, you know, maybe the design and the appeal of it is something that's more important to you. Um, just I would make sure that you have it on some kind of surface that um, you know for, for whatever reason you know there's a liquid or the worms you know there's a towel or something underneath it um, or a carpet little carpet square you maybe don't care about as much um, but I think it could be a feature of your home it's an it could be an education piece um, so you know like I said if you actually Google online worm composting bins there are some really cool designs i saw one i should i'll add it to my um slide deck that somebody took a repurposed uh dresser drawer uh you know they painted it and because of the drawers they used it and it was small so it wasn't like this huge dresser but they had the you know holes they drilled holes in the drawer wooden drawers and wood is great for worms because it's more breathable um but the uh, I painted the outside, not the inside. You want kind of more plain wood in the in the inside, but they drilled holes and the worms just rose in the top of the dresser. I thought that was super creative, but there are some really nice designs that you can get for inside that look cool. So I don't know, have fun with it. Okay, last question. When you add a handful of soil, can it be from a store-bought bag of soil? If not, is there some way we can determine what soil we pick up from outside? Ah, good question. I think the soil you tend to buy from the store is more like sterilized, not full of microbes. Um, I think what we're talking about is just picking a, a handful, a small handful of topsoil from your backyard. So you don't want subsoil. You know, subsoil is kind of more like the hard clay and it, you can tell it's devoid of organic matter. It's more, um, you know, tan color than that rich kind of topsoil color. So you want, you want topsoil and something that's got the living biology in it. So yeah, good question. All right, so I say let's move on for now. We'll, we'll have other, uh, keep your questions coming and we'll try to get, get to them all. We have plenty of time. Um, okay, so now let's talk about um, harvesting. Um, let me just see. Okay, so, um, so we're gonna share several methods. I know I'm, this picture is not a home composting bin, but I, I put it in because I think it just shows a really nice cross section. So. This is at um, Eco City Farms, uh, Benny Arez's site in um, Edmonston, Prince George's County. And what they do when the bin is full, you can see here that the food scraps are at the top and they wanna harvest that black gold that's below it. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna remove the top four to six inches of the worm bed, worm bed and they're gonna set it on top of a new bed or set it aside, and then they're going to harvest the vermicomposting that's below it. And that's one method. It's called, kind of called vertical separation. So you're just removing the top, you know, where the worms are living and just, you know, getting, and there'll be some worms below, but it's not a big deal. You can, um, in your worm compost, it's fine, or you can, you know, you can um, pick them out. Okay. So, um, the bins that we buy for the home composting, they kind of 
are using that same method that I kind of described earlier, the vertical separation. So you're going to um, set the tray on, you know, you're going to set the tray on top of a working worm bin and it has that screen and then you're only going to feed in the top tray and you're going to ignore the bottom tray where the bedding's gone and the food scraps are gone. You're going to wait till all the food scraps are gone and then the worms are going to just go to where the food is and eventually most of the worms are going to move up to the top tray and then you've got a tray of finished compost. So, And that's what it may look like. So this is a schematic from can of worms, this is a can of worms. And so it's it's done. I, I just kind of let it finish and then I put food scraps here and then this was this was ready to harvest. By the way, a lot of these systems at the bottom have this bottom tray that collects any of the moisture that drips through. And so every now and then you need to kind of check that. Some of them have this kind of spigot or spout so you can just turn it on and drain it. And, um, and this is what I mean for if, if you don't have it under your sink or it's not a garage, if you've got a spout, I do think sometimes it can drip like they don't, you know, close completely. It's not pouring out, but it's like, you know, maybe a drip drip. So that's why, you know, if you're doing it like in your apartment or you have nice wood floors, but if you're putting it on something or have a, like a little bucket here, you know, or some cup or something, just to be aware of, of those things. But that's vertical separation. Now, sideways separation, again, kind of harnesses the idea or takes advantage of the idea that the worms will move to the food. So if you, you know, this side is done, you know, maybe you create bedding, new bedding on one side of your bin and you stop feeding on this side and you're putting fresh bedding. Again, they don't like to live in their castings. They like fresh bedding. So if you're putting fresh bedding and food and then you wait a couple of weeks, most of the worms are going to move over to this side. That's sideways separation. And then you can harvest the finished compost on this side. And this is a system, I think this is a bin, Rhonda shared this photo with me, I think it's in Chile, where this is more like a, a farm site, a community garden farm site. And they have, this is all a worm bin around this tree. And they take, take advantage of, um, these are like shade cloths that they use here. It's not a plastic, but they will stop, they just feed on one side, one side, and they keep rotating. And eventually, you know, if it's done on this side, they stop feeding and the worms move to this side. Then they stop feeding the worm. I thought that was cool. And it's so beautiful, like the stonework, this worm bin they built. So I had to share that. Um, and then light separation is another technique. This is a, a fast way. It can be a little back breaking, I want to warn, so don't bend over. Do get yourself a table. So if you have a nice sunny day or, you know, you're not taking it outside, but, you know, get a light over it and a table. This has um, a sheet of plastic on the table. And what you're going to do is you're going to um, make these kind of pyramids, these little piles of your bin. You're going to empty it out. And the worms um, don't like the light. So what they're going to do is they're going to go into the pile, right? And then you're just going to scoop the top. When, and, and it just takes a few minutes. You can make the piles walk away for five minutes, come back, and then you can just scoop the top part of the pyramid off. There's no worms in there. Make a separate pile of the compost without the worms, form it into a pyramid again, and the worms go down, scoop out the top. Now, I'm, I have a short video, I'm going to try to play it, I think it's on the next slide, that kind of demonstrates what we're talking about. And Sophia, let me know if the sound doesn't play just so I know, but let's hope it does. Okay. It's very quiet. You can't really hear you. Okay, so I'll talk over it. I'll play it one more time because I think what it's doing is coming through, not my headset, which is what you guys are hearing. So I'm going to actually turn the sound off when I play it. Oops. So the pile's done. We're scooping up the top. The worms are at the bottom, and she's going to turn it over, and the last pile has all the worms. So eventually what you do is you combine the piles as you make them smaller and it's amazing how that little pile has so many worms. It's 
nice and fluffy too. And we've been combining, anyway, all right, I think you get the idea. Just love that last picture. Okay, so um, we are trying to, okay, let's see if I can go to the next one. So um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yep, okay, good. All right, good. Uh, so the last pile has all the worms. And, um, and now you haven't handled the worms. So notice that it, none of these processes or methods, or is it ever about picking out the worms and touching them? You're really um, taking advantage of the fact that the worms don't like light or they're gonna move by themselves to where the fresh bedding is and the, and the, and the fresh food is or more food. And then you get to harvest the compost and have the worms. So again, it's not about picking. You know, occasionally there's worms in the finished compost and yeah, you can, you know, pick it out and do it, do it gently. Okay, so let's now, now you got your compost and it's, um, you need to store it or you're gonna use it. When you, when you buy earthworm castings, they may be in like a plastic bag like this, but it, it, t it tends to have like tiny, tiny little holes because there's still, it's full of microorganisms, these beneficial microorganisms. So it's alive with this biology. So you don't want to starve them. You know, you don't want to kill the microorganisms by putting them in a plastic bag without any holes. Um, and so storing it in a dark, warm place inside a bag or a bin with a lid, you want some aeration, you want to retain some of that moisture. If you do let it dry out, it becomes, it, they, it comes hard. So um, do pay attention to storing it or using it right away. Often I'm doing the harvesting when I want to use my compost. I think, I don't know if we have more questions. We can maybe just move on because that wasn't a lot, but um, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm just going to move on. So keep your questions coming. Let's just, now just talk a little bit about using it. So. Um, just like with regular compost, there's lots of uses um, for vermicompost. You can use it in gardens. You can use it as a, you know, sp sprinkling on your lawns, around trees and nurseries for house plants. So if you don't have a yard, but you have an apartment and you have house plants, you can use it in there. Um, this is um, some of the, from Rhonda, uh, the guidelines on how much to use depending on what you use. So if you're using compost for established plants, you don't actually need a lot. It's like two tablespoons per quart of potting mix around the base of the plant, and you can repeat that every two to four weeks. If you're growing seedlings, you can combine one part of your vermicompost with four par parts of the potting mix. Um, for transplants, it's um, add half a cup to the hole prior to planting. For small containers, for larger plants and shrubs, it may be closer to one to two cups. And for a lawn, this is like, you know, a little less than a pound per 100 square feet. For, for an established lawn, for a new lawn, it's, you know, it's, a hun it's one pound, it's not that much more, but. Um, so, and this is, um, I think I was away for six weeks one summer and I came back and my I used the vermicompost growing my jalapeno peppers and that little front yard I showed you at the beginning. And that is the size, this is what happens when nobody harvests the jalapenos in, a comp, in a peppers, plants grown in compost. Um, this is some photos from Benny. There's actually lots of more in-depth scientific research on the benefits of vermicompost to growing all kinds of plants and disease suppress suppressants and some of the stuff I said at the beginning with the plant hormones. But this is where he's had tomato plants grown in um, right, the vermicompost is in the middle. The other compost uh, kind of store-bought is um, on the side. And uh, he just shows from the same time when it was planted um, to however much time later, how the vermicompost uh, tomato plants are thriving. So just want to kind of touch on compost tea. And I said before, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet about compost tea. You'll see sites that you can drain the liquid from your vermicomposting system and use it. it that is not compost tea. Uh, I know people do full workshops on how to produce compost tea. We are not doing that today, but I just want to clarify for you that that liquid um, is not what you want to use on edible plants. Um, you could use it on shrubbery or on your trees. So 
you know, if you, ha you know, if you're in an apartment, you can pour it down your drain too. But you know, if it's easy for you to just take it outside and 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 dump it on a lawn or trees or something, you're not growing um, f food or planning to eat it. Um, that's fine. But um, what what compost is, that's leachate. Uh, what compost tea is is if you take the finished compost. You're, you're ready to use compost and you add water to it and um, and then you drain that. That's your compost tea. It's made from finished compost. It's not the liquid that drains from your bin. And the reason uh, we want you to pay attention to that is because it's passed through undigested kind of maybe aerobic conditions in the worm bin. So, you know, we you know it's not it's not ideal and, and and it's not compost tea whereas the compost tea has um all full of that beneficial microbes that's in your finished compost all right so at this point we're going to run a few more polls to see how well we did in um so get ready to participate and how well we did in sharing some of this information so our first poll is what items should you leave out of your worm bin and you can select all that apply. All right, we've got most of you voting. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So very good. No meat and dairy, no citrus, no onions. So moldy kitchen scraps. If, if it's, you know, the moldy banana peel or a moldy strawberry top, absolutely put it in. That mold is just the microbes beginning to break down that material. So the worms actually love the moldy stuff, the moldy uh, strawberries and, and, and whatnot, because it's, they don't have teeth. It's already um, begun to break broken down and they can consume it more readily. So the mold is not a problem. Broccoli stalks, we didn't talk about, but they're kind of picky eaters. So if you put a whole, you know, four inch broccoli stalk in, it's not going to disappear. Remember, they don't have teeth, so you need more surface area. And so, you know, we wouldn't want to eat a whole plate of broccoli stalks, and the worms don't either. They, they kind of like a little bit of a mix of stuff. So, and that goes with coffee grounds too, that picture I showed, I kind of mixed the coffee grounds with the other food scraps. But if you have broccoli stalks, it's not a problem. Just try to chop it into smaller pieces and uh, don't have that be the only thing you're adding to your bin. It'll just be harder to, um, you know, harder to break down and disappear. Okay. All right. So, Isenia fed it a worms eat what percentage of their body weight? each day. All right, we share results. All right, very good, 25 to 35 percent. So it's about one third, a quarter to one third um, is uh, what they're eating. So keep that in mind in terms of how much you can, how much you start with, and how much you, um, how much surface area you have, and um, how much food scraps you're putting in each day. All right. So here, if you have one pound of worms in your bin, how much food scraps can you feed them each day? See, we can get more of you participating and we'll close the poll. All right, I'll show the results. So yeah, it is one third one quarter to one third. 82. So um that's that's right. So remember, if you only have a start with a pound of worms, you're starting with a small amount of food scraps. All right, so let's see, do if I have any more. Okay, what, which of the following statements are true for worm composting? And here you can select all that apply.
Let's see if we can get a few more of you voting. I'll close the poll in a second. Here we go, closing it and sharing results. Okay. So yeah, the goal is not to heat up the bin. Um, add one pound of worms to one square foot surface area of bin, and the worms will reproduce in three to four weeks. And you cannot use any type of earthworm for vermicomposting. You have to get the right type. Uh, we recommend the Isenia, Isenia fetida. Get it from a reputable source. And do not just go into your backyard and get any kind of earthworm because you may end up with earthworms that like to live in the soil or burrow. And the earthworms we're using are ones that are surface eat eaters, where they rise to the surface to eat the food scraps. Soil is not a good bedding. So you're also not going out and just getting soil and using that as a bedding because these type of worms do not live in soil. And, and when I say get a handful of soil to add to your bedding, that is just for the microorganisms and the grit. It's kind of like an inoculant. It's not the bedding. So remember, you're not using soil as the bedding. You're going to create your bedding from newspaper, the coconut core, some fall leaves. A mix of those things is all good. All right, so um, we're going to um, talk now about the rebate program. So uh, you have to be a DC resident to qualify for the city's rebate program. It's run like the city's um, rain barrel program, where you have to do, put in $25 of your own money before you get any of the rebate, a dollar of the rebate back. So if you buy a $40 worm composting bin, and you apply for a rebate, you're only going to get a check for $15. If you buy a bin that's $100, you will get the full rebate of $75. If you spend uh, more than $100, the maximum is still $75. So um, you, where the group, our nonprofit, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, is the group running this program for the Department of Public Works. So we will be the ones checking your uh, proof of residency. You don't need to be a U.S. citizen just to prove that you live in D.C. So we will take a driver's li photo of your driver's license, a utility bill. People have sent us the front page of their lease, even the deed to their property. So um, and the address on that document has to match with where your worm bin was sent and where you want your check mailed to. So it has to align. You can say we can save you time and us time of all those things align. We do need a full receipt. So it's got to be a legitimate receipt. It's got to show the vendor. It's got to show the date. It's got to show that the dollar amount was paid. And it's got to show that the worm bin was on there. So we know that's what you bought. Um, so if you bought it online, it would be good to have your address on there. If you're going to a local store, to buy it, you know, obviously, you know, if a Home Depot or your local hardware store is selling a worm bin, you know, your address is not going to be on there. We know that. And then the other thing I really want to emphasize is that um, we've been running this program for three years and our contract is ending in early September. The city is hoping to continue the program, but there is no guarantee. And as far as I know, Public Works' budget has not been approved yet. So um, they haven't even issued an RFP for a contractor or to renew our contract. So if you really do want to get a rebate and get a bin, I would urge you to get that in in the next two to three weeks to us because it takes it, it's not so much time for us to process the rebate, but it does take time for the checks to be mailed to you and we have found for you to actually deposit them in your account and we would like those checks to clear our account by early September otherwise our nonprofit doesn't get paid uh, for paying you so please help us out by applying quickly and when you do get your check please deposit those checks as soon as you can um, now I just want to mention that the payment will come in an envelope that looks like this and it doesn't have a DC address, it actually has a California address, and it doesn't say Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and it doesn't say Home Composting Rebate, and it doesn't say DC Department of Public Works. Why? That's because 
Our nonprofit uses a bill payment system that mails the checks from California. However, it does say payment enclosed, and if you open it, there'll be materials from us that has our name on it and says this is your rebate. But we have had a few people, their households thought it was scam or junk mail and it got tossed. So we don't really have a lot of wiggle room between now and early September to cut you a new check. So I'm trying to emphasize when you get the check, open it and deposit it. Okay, so it's going to look like that. So I just want to share some sample retail um, prices. And again, these may have changed. Different sites have different prices, but the Vermi Hut, you know, has a five tray. I think they also have a three tray. The Worm Factory, $115. The the Worm um, bag is actually quite big and it's 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 uh, designed to be easier to harvest right from the bottom so that's kind of interesting but i think you kind of need a a basement um or somewhere to flat you can see from the frame it really needs a uh make sure you know out if you're doing it outside and you're buying one of these systems with the legs you you do need um flat ground and one thing i'll just mention um I find, I don't know why these systems design it, but I find these legs kind of wobbly. The system gets heavy, whereas the Vermi Hut and the Worm Factory, you see, is just more stable. And this hot frog, these don't even screw in. Like, I had to hot glue them in. I don't know why they designed it, but this is the one I had in mind for the person who asked about, I don't have room in my small apartment. <sighs> so annoying, it does that. Um, that kind of looks cool. Um, so, you know, maybe just look for something that's, and it comes in different colors. I think this comes in purple in addition to green, maybe some other colors. So, you know, that might be a fun thing to start with. Um, a note about the law, especially if you're doing it outside, inside your home, it doesn't matter. But um, this program came about through the passage of a law in D.C., the Home Composting Incentives Amendment Act of 2018. And it not only set up that you get the rebate if you take a training, but it also clarified that if the, you're the owner of a residential property in the district, that you have the right to compost on your property as long as you are not creating a nuisance. So none of this nuisance odors or promoting vectors, which is another word for rats and mice and raccoons and possums and the like. So if you're planning to do it outside and you don't own your own property, you know, depending on the size of the bin, you may want to um, contact your landlord or property manager. And the other thing I'll say if you're doing it outside, um, avoid clutter around your bin because rodents like clutter have three feet space around it. Don't put it near your trash can. Don't put it near your recycling bin. You know, keep it away um, and just kind of if you have any questions about rodents where you are in DC outside feel free to email us and um, let me just actually go ahead and I'll come back to that that final tips but our email at ILSR is DC home composting at ILSR.org so you have questions about the composting process or you want to um, email us your rebate that's where that comes you go on to the city's website zerowaste.dc.gov slash home composting to actually get the rebate application and I think Sophia is putting that link in the chat now and if you have questions about you know hey this program ended are you going to continue it because I bought my bin in September and I have all the documentation you can email the Office of Waste Diversion. You can also email your local um, city council person to ask them to make sure there's money in the budget to continue. But if you do end up buying a bin after our, this current contract ends, keep your receipts. When the city starts the program again, if and when, you will still qualify for the rebate. And all, we will have all your documentation that you attended this workshop and qualify for the rebate. So I hope the city will get the budget they need. And then um, I will just say again, these are just the kind of tips. Again, you know, check moisture. Don't turn your bin. Uh, some people buy the tumblers and they think they're a worm bin. They're not. Worms do not like to be tumbled. Uh, feed small, small pieces. Don't feed more until the last feeding is consumed. Otherwise, you'll have rotting food and always cover those food scraps. And so with that, I think I will stop screen sharing and see oh before I stop screen sharing and we'll take time for questions let me just leave this slide up is um, when we close the webinar or you leave you'll I think a survey will pop up and the survey will um, 
ask you some for input on how well we did on the on the workshop but there's also a few demographic questions and we are continually improving our workshop so we really like would love your feedback and um, we also have an internal goal in our nonprofit to be more inclusive and to reach more diverse audiences so we're trying to see how well we're doing on that so that's why we have some of those demographic questions but I am promising you that we will never share personal identifying information on you with anybody else it's just we're using it for aggregate purposes to see how well we're doing meeting those goals all questions are optional please only feel comfortable answering questions that you feel comfortable answering all right so with that I am going to stop sharing my screen and we have plenty of time for your remaining um, questions okay we do have some more questions that came in um, the first one is how do you know if you've used too much compost on your plants I mostly have flowers and some herbs yeah you know it's a good question on the one hand it may not hurt at all because you know you just kind of it's 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 this black gold so it has so much value that it's nice to spread it around and and not kind of waste it because after like about you know using 30 percent by volume in a soil bed you know you're kind of wasting it but if your compost sometimes the compost can have like high salts um and so if if it if it does happen to have too much of something and you're that's all you're planting in then it can harm your plants i don't know sophia if you have other thoughts on this but yeah, no that's that sounds right there's more science to it um it particularly will rob the nitrogen which is something that your plants really need to grow so um yeah it it only you know robs the nitrogen like in compost for hot composting you tend to have more woody pieces in it um and if the there's still wood or you know twigs or something that are breaking down then this then it it will take the nitrogen from your plants to break down those woody materials but if you've got worm compost um i don't i don't think it's stealing the nitrogen from the plants for that i think it's more this if the compost has something in it that's too much you know too much of anything cannot be so great so salts is something that comes up pretty often can be an issue okay let's see um i use plant pots with a watering chamber under the soil i can water from above and below could i put the liquid into the under chamber in my flower pots is there nothing to be gained by using the liquid you could try it um you know again if 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 there's you know if it's high in salts or something like that then maybe that's an issue but you know if you've got several plant pots with the watering chamber and you want to do like two of the plants are the same you know it might be interesting to see like if you use the liquid from your worm bin which is high in nutrients you know if your plants got bigger or anything and if you do send us pictures maybe we'll add them to our slide deck and use them so let let us know okay um how often should you feed the worms yeah so um you know and, and i didn't answer this but we do get this question like if you're going away on vacation you know <laughs> will they survive and um so you can feed them it, it's a surface area so and and how many pounds did you start with so it's really not about how often it's you know you want to see that the food waste is they're eating the food waste so you don't want it can be more of a problem to overfeed them by the way than underfeed them but if all their bedding is gone and there's no more food scraps and they're actually trying to escape you know they that you need to feed them more but you know you can feed them every day if you have enough uh food scraps and you have enough surface area and you're not you know you're, you're taking advantage of your surface area you're feeding in one spot and then the next spot but you don't want to add food waste on top of all food waste so how often really depends on how big and how many worms and how much food scraps you have okay just um a couple clarifying questions you can only 
um, use either the Vermi composting rebate or the home composting rebate per household. Uh, yes, you will be getting these slides and a copy of a recording of this presentation. Um, a point of clarification, Brenda, um, am I understanding this correctly? When using the tray bins, all of the layering is happening in the same tray. Once the worms are done breaking down that food, a new tray with layering would be added? Yes, so if you're saying that each tray has bedding, each tray has, you're adding the food scraps, and then on top of each tray, you're covering the food scraps every time you're adding them with an, another layer of bedding or shredded paper, yes that happens and then that tray the worms finish eating it all it turns into the black gold and then you start a new tray and you do all of that again thank you for clarifying that um can you talk more about in-ground vermicomposting and any potential pros and cons well again in ground i'm not sure what you mean but I'm not sharing my screen again, but if you remember, um, let me just see. I think we have time, so let me just see how quickly I can do this um, to show. Okay. Is that showing? No, it's not, is it? No, not yet. Mm. Okay. There we go. We can see your screen. Oh, okay, good. So let me um, let me just go back. I just want to go way to the beginning here when I showed um, this one. Okay, so even these these outside systems. Now again, these are more like institutional settings. The one on the picture on the top right and the bottom left. They're not in the ground. They're above the ground, even though they're on the ground. And so, again, these epigeic worms are not the type of worms that live in soil. So you're not composting in the ground. You can create these kind of trenches. So you, if, you're, you, if you're trying to build something in the ground, you can create trenches. You're kind of lowering the top of the soil, if you will. So, you know, there's lots of resources. Again, I we sent you to um, Rhonda Sherman's website, but even if you go to her website, you know this is for Vermi composting for households and how to set up a bin. But if you click on ver this, this ver you know and she has hot composting too. But if you click on Vermi composting, you'll get to the more the institutional, some of the other ways. I will just say that in DC, where we have a lot of rat pressure, particularly in, in downtown in the alleys, that if you are wanting to compost outside with the worm bin you are going to want to have something that's enclosed and away from trash the buffet that's attracting the rodents there in the first place so just you know keep keep that in mind i don't know if there's further questions on that we're happy to try to to answer those but you know you can create a trench you know in the ground or above the ground and feed open but i do not recommend that in dc because we're in an urban area. I would be very careful. If you live in a rural area or the suburbs, you know, you know, you, you can still be attracting raccoons and, you know, I don't know, other animals, you know, to your to your outside pile if it's just kind of more open like that, which is why we don't recommend that. Especially if you're just starting out. We're trying to set not only you up for success, but we're trying to set up in DC helping the home composting program to succeed in in DC and nothing will doom it more than reports of more rodents and rodent problems and critters so that's why I think this is really important thank you for asking that okay we have one oh two more questions hold on a few more questions just came in I'm planning to keep my worm bin outside how do you keep the bin cool in the summer Cool in the summer, put it in the shade. <laughs> um, and uh, make sure it's really moist. And really pay attention to not having too much volume. You don't want it to heat up. Um, a shade tent if you don't have a tree. Um, yeah, some kind of screen on it. 
that's the best we can do somewhere where it can maybe get airflow so not like against a you know a wall you know where there's I don't know you just keep that in mind um, how to how to cool them okay and um, another question on the rebate I can only use one rebate ever or can I do worms one year and hot composting another year right now the system is one rebate ever I, I mean I think it should ch it could change so again this is a perfect example where you can exercise your citizen muscle to contact your not only public works but DC um, your local city elected official and let them know you you want more than one rebate or you need you know your family needs another hot composting bin or you need the rebate to cover the accessories that's not within our control unfortunately Okay, I've seen online that diatomaceous earth can help with insect pest control like millipedes. Do you have any experience with this? Mm. I do not. So we'll look that up and see if we can get back to you. Diatomaceous earth. I do know in general, you know, be careful of adding things that hurt microbes. <laughs> and because if they hurt, even if they don't hurt the worms, there's a huge diversity of life in the worm bin, as well as in the hot composting bin. And you want all of that diversity to thrive because it's not just the worms that are breaking down the food, it's the other microbes in the bin. So I would generally, when in doubt, for sure, leave it out. And, and when it comes to adding things that kill other living things, I would also leave those out. But I will check on the diatomaceous earth. Yeah, I've used it for other applications, like if you're seeing ants and stuff, and the way that it works is it's um it it its particulates will infiltrate like the skin and outside bodies of insects to I'm pretty sure kill them. I don't that doesn't sound like something that would be good for worms. I've never particularly used them for a worm application, but because worms are so soft bodied, I think that 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 abrasive quality would not work well for them, but we can definitely follow up. Um, that was our last question, Brenda. Yeah. We had um, a question that was submitted when people registered about um, um, composting during the winter outside, and I think I mentioned earlier, so maybe I already answered this question. But you know, if you have a, you know, there's a deep freeze coming you know, get an old blanket, get it at a thrift store, tarp over it, you know, actually a layer of snow, you know, makes it harder, you know, if we ever get a foot or two feet of snow again, it insulates the bin. So keep the snow on the bin, but uh, makes it harder to use it. Um, but yeah, the worms can live through the winter, you know, try to insulate them. I know at a school in Arlington, they had an outdoor bin in their courtyard worm bin, you know, kind of like some of the pictures I showed you before. Um, um, and they had straw bales just around it to help insulate it. So there are ways to, to help the worms get through the winter. But yeah, you can do it year round. And then somebody else said, can you, will it work on a small balcony in the shade? And yes, I think a small balcony in the shade, if you've got an apartment, that would work great. So I think we did get to most all of your questions. Yep. All right. So. Yep, so the survey will pop up, answer whatever you feel comfortable doing. We appreciate all the feedback and love notes are good too. We share our love notes with our funders and our team and uh, happy composting and enjoy the rest of your this beautiful day. And thank you, Sophia. And um, uh, we look forward to processing your rebates quickly. All right, take care, everybody.